Good morning, New Holland. Appreciate you being with us today. Uh, pray God blesses you. Uh, I know that he has. I pray that he will. I pray that he will. We're in our second series on uh, God's amazing church. Last week, we talked about the church we should be welcoming. We should uh, be embracing. We should always reach out in love and kindness and goodness and take people the way God takes us. Just love people where they are. Help them go from where they are to where they need to be. That's where God found me. God didn't find me perfect. God found me in need. So many people today, they, they try to, uh, well, as soon as I can get ready, preacher, as soon as I can get this taken care of, as soon as I can clean my life up, then I'll come and, and, and I'll give my life to Christ and I'll serve in the church. And I'm like, well, that day's never going to get here. We're never going to get good enough, are we? We're never going to get everything put together. And aren't you grateful that even though God saves you, oh no, and even though you're still messed up, and even though you still have issues and problems and troubles and heartaches and pain, God still loves you there. And the greatest thing that ever happens to anybody is their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the church should be the outgrowth of that. We should be the representation of God in this world. We should be the best representation of God in this world. So if you have your Bible, take it and turn to Matthew chapter number 18. <clears throat> Only going to look at two different scriptures today. <clears throat> and I pray God will bless <clears throat> his word today because that's who speaks. Well, we don't, we don't need to hear Brian speak, but we, we need to be open to hear the Lord speak as only God can. God's amazing church. The church is more than a building you visit, and it should be more than an event you attend. Now, today's friendly, and I appreciate all the ones that were invited <clears throat> guests to be with us, and I appreciate the guests for coming to be with us today. But the, when, when you invite someone to church, it's not about the building. I know in our day-to-day, -day, that's the first thing that you think of when you think of church, is the building, the parking lot, the sign. Matter of fact, we are told today that when a guest comes to our church, the first three minutes, the first three minutes, is when they're going to decide what they think about your church. Do you think that we should have someone in the parking lot welcoming them to come? If, if they're going to make up their mind then, wouldn't it be a pretty good idea to have someone out there in the parking lot saying, thank you for coming, God bless you, we love you in Jesus' name, welcome to New Holland Baptist Church. And then when we see the representation of who we are here, I mean, from the time that they walk in the door, everything that we do should be uh, a, a representation of the God that we love and this, that we serve. We were made in the image of God. I mean, everything about us, we were made in the image of God. And we should reflect that image of our maker in everything that we say, in everything that we do. And how we say what we say, and how we do what we do. And church, please hear me. When I say this, God made us unique, and the church was made, people were made for community. There are no lone rangers in God's kingdom. When you get to heaven, God's not going to give you this little bitty place that's going to be yours, and you're just going to get to sit there and abide in your little place and enjoy your little place and Every now and again, you may stick your head out and say, oh, this sure is nice, and then walk back in and sit down in your holy recliner. <clears throat> God has more for us than that. When God made Adam, and he put him in the perfection of this earth, in the place where everything was so absolutely gorgeous, 
Can you think about this? At that, at that point in time, sin had not come to the earth. All of God's nature was unhindered. The beauty of every flower, of every bush, of every tree, of every song, of every bird, every smile on every animal's face was there representing the glory of God in all of God's love and its nature. And Adam was there, thankful for life, but Adam said, there seems to be something missing. Community. And God saw that. And God already knew that this would be part of his plan. But so that Adam would understand the value of it, God made Adam and then God made Eve to come and be the helpmate. To be the one to walk beside. Listen to me well. To be the one that would help complete him and the one that he could help complete them. One to come make him better, but it was community. One that he could help be better as well. So even then, it wasn't all about Adam, and it wasn't all about Eve. It was about them being together. And heaven, God's eternal home, is a place of celebration. It's a place where all of God's created beings and those that are there now who walk down this earth, they are there, here's the word, together. Together. And there's not any big shots and little shots. There's not any, the ones that's really got it all together and the ones that God's still working on. When we're there, made in the image of God, come on now, completed in Him, fulfilling His task, fulfilling His purpose, and our work is not done when we go to heaven. And we will continue to bring him honor and glory and praise. But we will do it in heaven together. You think that we would learn here on earth how we're going to live there in heaven. Right? So if God wants us to be one family, one heart, one community, one love, one truth in heaven then maybe he's given us a little time to get to know how to get along down here on earth. You think? If we're supposed to honor him with everything that we are in heaven, maybe we should learn to honor him with all that we are here on earth. Maybe we can... Learn to love. Now love in an expression means that it is pointed out. Anytime love is pointed in, it loses the essence of who it, what it is. So in the Old Testament, God represented himself to the earth by calling out a chosen people unto himself. Not that he loved them more, but so that they would be a witness to the world. God will give them his commandments so that they could follow them and others could see that. God would put his hand of blessing upon them so that others could see that. And when they messed up, God lovingly would correct them so that they could be the pure representation of himself. And yet, in the New Testament, it's not just the Jewish people, Israel. Matter of fact, they are the ones, those leaders are the ones who crucified Christ. Because they were, once again, their love was pointed at themselves rather than at God. So he called a group together from every corner of the world, of every nation and every race and every people. And he made them born again. He saved them. He loved them. He completed them. And he called them his church. Now, people are different. And churches are different. 
There's big churches and there's little churches and there's country churches and there's city churches. There's every flavor of people on this earth and accordingly there's every flavor of you ever heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together, the homogeneous unit? Isn't it funny how we can all kind of just find our own little group of people that's kind of like us? All right. And yet, there's still one God, one Savior, one faith, one hope. So you think it doesn't really matter if you're in the country or the city, if you're big or if you're little. Though I will tell you, people judge churches by secular worldly standards. God does it. You know how God looks at a church? Hope you hear this. One heart at a time, bound together in love. I don't care who you are. You don't have to be on the church staff. You don't have to be a teacher or a deacon or uh, on the trustees or uh, on any little group that we might have in the church. God loves you completely. And God wants his complete love in you. And you add something to his church. The church is incomplete without all of us together loving, serving our Lord and our Savior. Every church, as every Christian, should reflect God's truth, His love. And as we set ourselves out in this world, with all these different people that are out there and all these different backgrounds, and we should be the perfect reflection of him. In 73 verses in the New Testament, you will hear this word church. It means, you've, the, the Greek word is ekklesia. It means a gathering, the called out ones, an assembly united together. God's elect. We're also called the bride of Christ. He is our the husband. And we, I love this. When, when, when I found that woman, that man, she made the tune and fork go off in my heart. And I got to know her and she became my best friend. And, and it wasn't long, folks. I, I'd shock you if I told you how short of a time it was. But I said, Will you? And she said, I believe I will. <laughs> and we've been willing it together for 34 years and two weeks, three, four weeks. Four weeks, I guess, tomorrow. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. Hey, listen, I pursued her. Now, I don't know how much she was pursuing me. But when she said yes, the, the husband and the wife became a family together. We are the bride of Christ, the family of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Y'all know that story. You've heard it put together. I mean, we're not all mouths. I'm the big mouth. We got ears. We got eyes. We got, we got toes. And if you don't think that toe's important, you just hit it upside something one time and just try to walk with that sore toe. I mean, uh, how many of y'all have ever had a toothache? Praise God for all the nerves working perfectly together all over your body, right? A little bone spur can create a lot of pain. But when the body works together, man, it's wonderful, isn't it? We all come together in health. We're called a flock, a flock. And he is our shepherd, the shepherd in God's flock. We're called the house of God. First Peter says we are a spiritual house. Revelation chapter 2, we are the, or chapter 1, we are the golden candlestick. That is, we are the one that he puts his light and we shine 
out. Have you ever heard someone say, a, a city set on a hill, as they quote? We're to be the light of the world. We are called a vineyard or a garden. And he is the husbandman, the, the one who takes care of the garden. Praise God that he is. We're called stones in a temple where Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We're called citizens of a kingdom, ambassadors for Christ. We're just simply called family. And in every one of those illustrations, we are one of many led by the one. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was looking with his, at his disciples and he said to others, who do others say that I am? And his disciples gave him different responses. But then he said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Verse 15. Simon Peter, verse 16, answered and said, you are the Christ, that is the Messiah, the one sent from God, the one anointed of God. There is only one that is uniquely God, that through him we have an avenue, we have a way to be one with God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a powerful statement. I think it's easy for us as the church who've heard this story, who know this illustration, who know the backstory, who know the future story for us, to be able to look at that and say, well, sure. But for him, this was an unbelievable proclamation of faith. So he says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God of glory in heaven. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I love the picture of here we are, and for how are we ever going to know God? God reveals himself. Jesus just showed it to him. God's revealed this to you. And I also say to you that you are Peter. That's the nickname that he gave him literally a pebble, and upon this rock, I, Jesus Christ, will, always in present tense, always a, a point of action, build. We're not there yet, but he's continuously growing and building, working on us individually, working on us together. My, we belong, the church belongs to Jesus Christ, only to Jesus Christ. You may have been here 30 years. You may have been here 40 years. You may have been here 60 years. It doesn't belong to you. I may be the under-shepherd. It doesn't belong to me. You may have served this church in any kind of capacity, every kind of capacity. You may fill in some title that, that Ephesians chapter 4 talks about. But the church does not belong to you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It is His. I will build my called out ones, my church, my people, my family, my body. I will do this. And by the way, Everything that is of evil, everything that stands against God, every work of Satan, every plot, every lust, every covet, every way that he tries to come in to divide and conquer. Just understand, it will not work if we are connected to him, listening to him, loving to him, giving ourselves to him. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will, once again, present tense, and a continuous work, will not prevail against it. He is a defeated foe. It looks like he's winning sometimes. And it might, he might win a battle, but he has already lost the war. 
Satan's eternity is already set. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, his followers. Now, bear with me for just a second as I say this. He's not this red dragon with this long tail, ugly with a pitchfork in his hand. Y'all ever seen that picture? I call him a dirty dog, a flea-bitten varmint. I call him ugly. But the Bible calls him that when God created him, God created him full of wisdom, come on now, and beauty. When he came after Eve to deceive her, he looked wonderful. And and when he spoke to her, he used that wisdom. Come on now. He twisted it to make it about her rather than to make it about God. About her kingdom rather than his kingdom. He is still doing that today. He comes appealing. Appealing to us to build up what we think, what we want, our kingdom, our will, our way. But as a saved child of God, born again with the Holy Spirit of God within us, we should never for a skinny second do anything other than bring him honor and glory and praise. It's not about us, folks. Did you hear that? It's not about us. We belong to him. The church is his. And if we're here and we need to get there, and he's got the game plan to get us there, we need to bind together in love, protecting, encouraging, and helping each other, and be on one mission for him. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That doesn't mean he won't try. He's always, have y'all ever heard me say this? He always comes to divide and conquer. He'll try to get us to live for ourselves. But the church is God's people united together. This is a very simple statement that every one of y'all know, but I want to say it again. God wants to bless his church. God wants to bless New Holland Baptist Church. That means God wants to bless the people of New Holland Baptist Church. That means God wants to bless you. God wants to bless your family, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. Praise God, in this place, we got great-grandchildren. Now, that doesn't mean Satan's not going to try to divide husband and wife, parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren. Grandchildren may want to go their own way. Great-grandchildren may want to do their own thing. But somebody's got to love them. Miss Margaret got another great-grandchild coming. Amen, hallelujah, praise God for that. Amen. And you know what Miss Margaret's going to do and Harrison's going to do? They're going to love them children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way to the throne in glory. Amen. That doesn't mean that they're always going to listen. Somebody's got to be there. God wants to bless his church. God wants to grow his church. Y'all ever heard that saying, saying, us four and no more? We like it the way it is, let's keep it that way? That's not God's church. Everything that is alive grows. Y'all let that sink in just a moment. Now, I understand that in the part of growth, you look at a tree, that leaf that was blooming during a season, <coughs> the sap of that tree will push those old leaves off. But you know why? Because that means he's going to come in the next season and do something else. In the Garden of Eden before sin, 
Everything bloomed all the time. When we get to heaven, everything will bloom all the time in the new heaven and the new earth. But right now, we're going to go through seasons. But hear me, it's part of growth. God wants to grow his church. God wants to love his church. God wants to use his church. And God will keep his church. Satan may want to divide and conquer. God wants us to keep us one in the bonds of love. Take your Bible and flip over to uh, Hebrews chapter number 10. Y'all still with me? God's word for the people of God. Praise be to God. Amen. Don't we love the word of God? Aren't we grateful that we can not look in our thoughts, but we can look and hear a word directly for us that God wants us to hear today? It's always his word. Amen. It's always inspired. It's always infallible. It's always inerrant. It's always there for our good. So when we take God's word and we look deeply into his word, God wants to reveal himself to us. We're not perfect. So we come and we look in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast. My daughter teaches Second grade, they had field day this week. Y'all remember field day? Some of y'all remember tug of war? I remember back, I was talking with Jody about it. She was probably, I don't remember if it was Jared's class or if it was Jody's class, but it was one of the classes. And this one class had about 25 kids that showed up that day. The, only, the other class had about 15. And the teacher said, Brian, go over there and help them out. So they put me on the back, and I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And I grabbed a hold of that rope, and they said, go. And you know what those 15 kids did? They turned loose of it, and they turned around and looked at me. I'm like, hold on. Now, hold on. There were a bunch of midgets on the other side, but they were strong midgets. And I grabbed a hold of that thing, and I said, grab a hold of that rope. And they all said, oh, okay. And they grabbed it. They just thought I was going to do it all by myself. That's not how it works, is it? We need to hold on with everything that we have because if we don't all come together to hold on, what's going to happen? The enemy's going to push us in the wrong direction. Y'all hear that? He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. I don't need to tell you what that is because you already know what it is. You know what you confess to him. You know what you ask of him. You know that you gave your heart and life and you weren't supposed to take it back. Do I need to say that again? Some of y'all are thinking and they're like, well, but I'm doing my own thing. That's the problem. We've got too many people doing wrong. We've got too many people who've turned loose of the rope looking at somebody else to get it done. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, without wavering. One day, I think I'll do that. No, the next day, I don't know. I'm going to do my own thing today. Same God on the throne, listening to your prayers, watching over you, praying for you while you sleep, loving you, protecting you, keeping you, and he just wants to see what you're going to do today. He wants to see what you're going to do in that circumstance. It's easy to love the Lord when everything's good. It's easy to praise him when everybody's praising you. But are we going to be like Daniel when everything's coming against us and we still bow the knee to a holy God? Hey, you better quit that. We'll throw you in the lion's den. Praise God for the church that says, you do what you want. I'm going to honor the Lord with my life. Without wavering. We got too many people wavering today. That would have been a good time for an amen. It really would. we got too many people that are going, I don't know if I'm going to church today or not. I, think I, I don't think I'm going to read my Bible today. That person just cut me off in their car. I'm going to go give them the Stephen stare. 
Now, y'all might not know what that is, and I hope you never find out what that is. But people who have received it, they don't forget it. Look what he says here. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If we'll be faithful, I promise you he'll meet you there. And let us consider one another (laughs) in order to stir up love and good works. It's not about you. So let's, let's think about others. I don't want to go to church today. Well, get up and go anyway because you may be a blessing to somebody else. Right? Now, you may come and show up and you may feel... You may feel absolutely miserable, but God's light will shine on you. His love will pour out on you. Your heart will explode with his mercy and grace, and you'll leave this place shouting and singing his praises. But you may come just absolutely filled up and just want to, I don't, I don't. Somebody, you may need to sprinkle some of that God love on somebody else. You may need to be an encourager. You may need to help build them up. It's about us together. So here's the word. Consider. Instead of considering yourself, how you feel, what you want, consider someone else. You may be the person that got, oh, that's good. I hadn't even got it out of my mouth yet, and that's good. You may be the person that God has chosen to use to bless someone, and if you're not there to bless them, they're going to live, live with a deficit of it. But you don't consider that. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Hmm. Not forsaking. What does the word forsake mean? I'm not doing it. I'm going to leave it alone. If, if, if I was walking with my precious, dear, loving wife, by the way, whose birthday is Thursday, She gets older before I do every year. If I was walking with her and somebody came up and wanted to mug us, they wanted to take her pocketbook, and I just went to her and said, hey, you on your own. What would y'all think of me? Hold on. What would she think of me? Not forsaking we were bought with a very high price we are kept by a strong power and we will oh i don't know that we understand this or i don't know that we really think about this much but god has promised to hold our hand and be with us and carry us all the way to his heaven all the way throughout all of eternity and we are the beneficiary of that And he is saying, this is my body, my temple, my church, my called out ones, my elect. And you've walked away from it. And he puts this scripture in here to remind us. There's choices that God gives us in life. And and if I'm being loud today, I apologize. It's just bubbling in my spirit. I'm not trying to be rude. But I'm here to tell you, he says, what you need to do is don't walk away from the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Some are doing it. From time to time, some are just going to walk away. You invite them, hadn't seen you in church in a while. Yeah, well, two years ago when we gave, when we had to, to, to not assemble together it was the very hardest time in all of my ministry. I, I stood about halfway back, right there, about where John's at, and I put a camera in front of me, and I preached to an empty room. 
And we put it online and we said anybody who wants to watch it. Now, God, had, God was doing something even in that. We had people from 23 different states watch us. I don't know that we would have done that otherwise. And it definitely wasn't because of the power of the sermon that I preached. You can go back and look at them. They weren't that great. But God was doing something even then. And then when we missed Resurrection Sunday, and my, I said, we're supposed to come together to, to, to celebrate a risen Savior. And it burned me in my core. And when May 15th, and we could come together again, I said, praise God, thank you, Jesus, we're going to have church. Mark, I remember that day. What many of us here were there? We were here, weren't we? And I sang to the glory of God. Now, hold on. There was an invisible thing that went through. It was the flu, and it was, a, uh, it was probably more, a mo much more contagious. But it was the flu, and it had, on some people, it caught them, and it hurt them, and it killed some. But, folks, we have people who die of the flu every year. Was it in greater statistics? I, I guess so. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you, it was the flu that absolutely struck fear in everyone, and we went to our own places. We couldn't go to work. We couldn't do those other things. And, and everything that we as a church, come on now, whether flu or no flu, we as a church should not have stopped being the body of Christ. He never said be, a body of, be the body of Christ as long as it's good and it's easy and okay. And I know staff people at churches that, that died of COVID went to heaven. But I guarantee they went to heaven singing. When they opened their eyes in glory, God could have saved them, God could have healed them, but God, I, I, that's above my pay grade. But I'm here to tell you, some people in the last two years have learned to forsake the family of God. And others who may be attending have forsake the body works. And the church is more than a building or an event. We're supposed to come to be the, the, the eyes of Christ, the ears of Christ, the touch of Christ, the love of Christ. In this day in which we live, we need, more, we need to be more of the body of Christ than we've ever been in all of our life. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And by the way, I think the day is approaching pretty quick. It could be the second coming of Christ, or it could be my day that, that I'm on my last lap. I don't know how many days I've got left. But I don't want to say, Lord, I didn't know I only had a certain amount of time left, or I would have done more. I want to do all that I can today. Can I just stop? I'm not through, but I'm going to close. There's a word that for many people has become a dirty word. It's called commitment. And I believe integrity is seen in how we keep our commitments. I'm going to give you an example. Um, in my life, I've been on, I can't remember exactly, but it's over 30 mission trips. I love mission trips. It's not a vacation. You go to serve. You go to love. And there's something that happens to me when I go on a mission trip. It's kind of like the Tasmanian devil comes out of me, but it's in a good way. I get up early before everybody else, and I pray and I read my Bible because I know when we get up together, we got to go and we eat, and then we go. And we're serving. And we'll come back and we'll have lunch, and then we'll go serve. 
and then we'll come back and we'll have dinner and everybody else will take a shower and get cleaned up and I'm like no 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 I'm going out and I'm serving I'm not bragging on me I'm just saying this is what it's about and I remember the first time we went down to uh, Mississippi after the Hurricane Katrina had hit I was I was going from about five o'clock in the morning till about 11 o'clock at night and I had so much energy and I slept so good and what I found was more people were coming with us now on a mission trip if you've never been on one you go to a place and you get there and it's not like everybody brings a lounge chair and watches the preacher work that's not what happens greater than any time I've ever experienced anything in church when people go on a mission trip everybody works Everybody participates. No one says, I don't want to do that. We went to a place in Florida called Apalachicola. Well, it was just across the, the, there from Apalachicola. There's a little uh, town called East Point. I mean, there wasn't much there except slums. And we went to help a church that was hit from a hurricane that was not a Southern Baptist church. <gasps> As a matter of fact, this, this people came through with this, like a 25-foot boat behind them and said, what are y'all doing here? I said, we're helping this church. I saw your vans. You're not a, you're not a, it was an assembly of God. They said, you're not an assembly of God. What are you doing here? And I'm like, we're helping this church. We serve the same master. We serve the same Savior. I don't care what flavor of, of the body they are. They, we're just all one in the, in the bonds of love. Amen? They may worship differently than us. They may talk differently than I am, but uh, I don't care. I'm going to love those that Jesus loves. And they couldn't believe it. And I remember my wife <laughs> and a couple of the deacon's wives got in there, and they had a fellowship hall that had not been cleaned in about Forever. And I saw those three women, prim, proper women, wear out those leather gloves that come up to your elbow, clean it, and they never can gripe, they didn't complain, they didn't fuss. You know what they did? They served a risen Savior. I've never seen anything like it. But here's the point. Y'all listen to me? That's what the church is supposed to look like all the time. That's what heaven will look like. If you think that we're going to go up there and float on a cloud, Somebody's going to, some angel's going to come by and and have a feather and just uh, make you feel nice and cool and comfortable and bring you fried chicken. I mean, we're Baptists. They're going to bring us fried chicken, right? That's not what it's about. The song, does it? It's, I serve a risen Savior. And it's our privilege. We're the church. You ever heard anybody talk bad about the church? Why? This person's mad at that person. They they forgot what they're called to do. I'm going to say the word again. It's a dirty word. Commitment. That changes everything when we understand commitment. When you make a commitment, You keep your commitment. As he will keep you, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we should never forsake him. I don't care where you are in your journey. If you're looking at me and not looking at him, God's not through with you yet. 